Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and this is part two uh, of a video illustrating an exporting nation, as uh, because in the previous video we looked at an importing nation. We used uh, the example of steel production or the world steel production. Um, just says to refresh our memory, total world, uh, total world. Crude steel production was 1,869.9 million tons. And the biggest steel producing country uh, is China. And according to uh, Wikipedia, it states that 53.3% of the world steel production uh, is emanating from China. So China is by far the biggest producer, producing just over half of the world steel output. We looked in the previous video. Um, at the countries that were net exporters and net importers. We can see here that China is ranked number one as the largest net exporter, meaning that the, ex that their, the quantity of their exports of steel are greater than their imports of steel. And uh, they exported in 2017 60.9 million tons. The biggest importer of steel is the United States, or net importer, I should say, importing 25.2 million tons. And in the first video, we illustrated uh, the United States as an importing nation because their domestic production of steel in terms of the domestic price is greater than the world price. Thus, they do not have a comparative advantage because their costs of production are higher than the world price. So in this video, we're going to focus on China and China being an, a, an exporter of steel and illustrating how their domestic price of steel being below the world price enables them to export. So we're going to use two graphs side by side to illustrate this concept. The first graph, graph A, illustrates, again, the global industry. And industry, like we saw in the perfectly competitive market structures, where we were illustrating the industry and the firm, and how the industry establishes the price that all firms in all nations must accept. Because steel is a primary commodity, all firms are a price taker. So let's illustrate the global supply of steel and we're making this supply curve fairly inelastic since it's a primary commodity and we'll label this oops, we'll label that supply in the global economy so s g for global economy and that is composed of all the firms in all nations collectively the aggregate of all of those uh, steel producing firms composing the um, supply of the global industry. Then we have the downward sloping demand curve, fairly inelastic as well. Um, demand coming from firms that need steel as a key input in their production. So all firms worldwide that demand steel composes the demand side of the global steel industry. And we're going to label that demand in the global industry. The intersection of SG and DG provides point A, where we have an equilibrium price set at PW. We're going to label that price at world. And an equilibrium quantity supply and demanded in the global economy at Q world. We'll call that quantity supplied and demanded in the world, QW. As we saw in perfectly competitive market structures, the industry sets the price that all firms must accept. So we're going to draw the extension of this. This will be a perfectly elastic price that all firms in each nation must accept. And again, for uh, the national steel industry, that will be the price at world that they must accept. And we're going to label this also, um, this is price at world 
Oops, let me just fix that real quick. The world price, which is equal to the um, world supply curve. Okay. Now, uh, we're looking at a particular nation. Let's say that this is China. Okay. And let's illustrate their domestic supply and demand curves. So we're going to have the domestic supply curve right here. We'll call that supply in the domestic economy, SD. And we'll have their domestic demand curve. I'll go ahead and draw a straighter line, label uh, drawn as such. Okay, and we're going to notice that the equilibrium of their supply domestic curve with their demand in the domestic curve establishes an equilibrium at point B. And we notice that the domestic price is less than the world price. So here we have price in the domestic economy being less than the world price. And we're going to have a quantity supplied and demanded at Q1. Okay. So Chinese firms have lower costs of production. So they will produce domestically up to point B, but they're not going to stop because they can con continue to produce up to the world price. So when China opens up from being a closed economy to an open economy and engages in free trade, and because the world price is set above their domestic price, Chinese firms can increase their output from point B to this particular point C. So the quantity supplied increases. All right, from Q1 to, we'll label this QS. So quantity supplied increases along their supply curve. The quantity supplied increases because these firms are uh, productively efficient. They have lower costs of production, perhaps lower resource input prices, labor price uh, wages, uh, perhaps interest for um, capital, rent for land, et cetera. All of their resources are slightly less uh, than firms producing in other nations, unless they can increase the quantity of their output. Now, in terms of domestic demand, what happens for consumers in China, firms that consume steel as a key input, um, this is not such great news. They see that uh, they were better off in a closed economy because the price of steel was much lower, but the world price is higher, so the quantity of demand decreases. Right from point B to point, we'll label this point D. And again, we'll illustrate that. The quantity demanded decreases from Q1 to oops, QD. All right, so what becomes their exports? Basically, uh, Chinese firms will be producing along their supply curve, as we see here, from zero to QD. All right. And once they get to QD, that quantity of output will be consumed by the domestic demand. So the quantity of demand from zero to QD will be consuming the domestically produced Chinese steel. And that will be it. The remaining quantity being supplied from QD to QS will be exported. All right, so we will make a note that that amount from here to here will be the exports to other nations. And as we saw before in Wikipedia, 52.2% um, or, or China uh, makes up about 52.2% of the total steel, um, what was it, being produced worldwide? Let's see, 50, oh, sorry, 53.3% of world steel production. So they compose 
the majority or more, just over half of the total steel production and with that they become the China, um, the biggest net exporter of, of, um, of steel okay so that's represented uh, by that distance between D and C or from QD to QS so we'll note again that since QS is greater than quantity being demanded that's excess supply that will compose exports for China which is good for Chinese firms they're uh, productively efficient they are they have the comparative advantage thus they benefit from global trade they can increase output that produces more employment in the steel industry for China and they export it to other nations which becomes beneficial to importing nations because importing nations are buying steel at a world price that's less than their domestic production as we saw in the previous video and in the previous graph. So let's go ahead and analyze this as we would for a paper exam. As can be seen, we have two graphs, graph A and graph B. Both graphs are measuring quantity on the x-axis and price on the y-axis. Graph A is the global steel industry and graph B is the national steel industry for China. Looking at graph A, uh, we see an inelastic uh, demand curve, downward sloping according to the law of demand, labeled DG, meaning demand in the global economy. And that demand curve is composed of all firms worldwide that demand steel as a key input. We have an upward sloping supply curve according to the law of supply. The supply curve is inelastic. And it is composed of all firms worldwide that produce steel. Thus, uh, this is the supply in the global economy, the aggregate of all firms that produce steel. Where SG equals DG at point A, it sets an equilibrium uh, world price at PW and equilibrium quantity supply and demanded in the world at QW. That creates the perfectly elastic price that all firms in China must accept in graph B. So we see that in graph B, that perfectly elastic price at world is equal to our world supply curve. We have an upward sloping supply in the domestic account for China labeled SD and a downward sloping demand curve in China labeled DD, demand in the Chinese domestic economy. And where SD equals DD at point B, it establishes an equilibrium price at uh, PD or price in the domestic economy with an equilibrium quantity supply and demanded at Q1. When China opens up to world trade, they find that the world price is above their domestic price. Thus, it incentivizes Chinese domestic firms to increase their production from point B to point C along their uh, domestic supply curve or from Q1 to QS. In terms of domestic consumption, it decreases. That higher price reduces the ability of Chinese firms to consume steel. This is a decrease in the quantity demanded from point B to point D or from Q1 to QD. Thus, since QS or the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded, that enables China to export that excess supply to other nations. That achieves global allocative efficiency, which is something we'll talk about in the next series of videos. All right, and that's it. If you have any uh, comments uh, or questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.